I was born to a people with a deep sense of color and traditions. But we have no book to tell us where we came from. 5,000 years ago, an ancient culture spread across the planet. From Madagascar to Easter Island, from Taiwan to New Zealand, it expanded across half the globe. Where did these people come from? And how do our stories connect us in this modern world? My name is Yoshifu. I am an indigenous artist traveling through Taiwan and beyond. To retrace the forgotten rituals and the culture that my ancestors may have spread across the Pacific. My name is Julian Davison. I'm a historian and anthropologist. And I'm on a quest to locate the point of departure for one of humanity's greatest voyages. We're searching for clues as to how a Stone Age population embarked on a journey across the Pacific Ocean. You can feel the boat really charging through the waves. And made their language family the most widespread in the world. In terms of the history of all the great empires, Alexander the Great, the Romans, the language didn't spread that freely, not on the scale of Austronesia. Hoping that the traces they left can show us what's bring us together today. I'm going to shock for this, I'm shaking. To reconnect once and for all, the features of your people look so similar to the features of my people. In the mythical land of ancestors. Taiwan, home to one of Asia's most cosmopolitan cities. Beneath the glitter of its skyline are deep traditions, brought to the island by Han Chinese settlers over centuries. But digging deeper, one will find an even older culture that runs across the land. Represented by indigenous inhabitants, 16 indigenous peoples spread across the island. And today, the largest group, the Amis, is celebrating an ancient ritual, the Illison or Harvest Festival. To understand it better, I need the help of my Amis friend and artist, Yoshifu. Before we go, you need to wear this yeah. traditional lover bag. Lover bag? Yes. What's that? Normally, in this celebration, where female chose the husband, if the girl like you, she will put some beetle nuts in your bag. If you like it, you just hold her hand, really? then you can dating. There we go. Yeah. Right, well, you didn't tell me I'd end up married at the end of the day. Oh, you never know today. <laughs> you, you might be a lucky man. <laughs> At the center of the rites is a sacred tree with offerings for the ancestors. At the center, you see, this is the bitterness tree. It's very, very important uh, for our culture, the tree of life. In the Iber of Borneo, the, the tribe that I studied, they do exactly the same thing. And this tree is a mythical tree which grows at the edge of the universe. During their festivals or Gawai, the Ibans summon their ancestors around a sacred tree to ensure the prosperity of the community. Are these rites somehow connected? a very pretty girl, but I don't think she dropped a bit of beetle nut in my bag. At least I don't think so. 
I may not have found myself a wife, but at least I'm not leaving the tribe empty-handed, as I witnessed an ancient cultural tradition that shares ties with others far beyond the shores of Taiwan. Just how far do the branches of this culture spread? And where are its roots? The Amis do not keep written records, but they do pass their stories down from one generation to the next. So back at Yoshifu's workshop, I want to dig deeper into his memories. My ancestor lived this land maybe took about five or six thousand years. It ties in with the archaeological record, which seems to indicate that your tribe and the ancestors came here five or six thousand years ago. The order will tell us the story. I remember one of the story. It took about once upon a time at the land as full of people, not enough for all the people to leave. They sent one boy and one girl with the boat, uh, gave it to them enough water, fruits, and seed, send them to find out the new land. We are the voyager. Indeed, you are. <laughs> How far could they have reached? A special contingent from afar may give us some clues. The Nati Manu tribe has travelled almost 10,000 kilometres from New Zealand to take part in this year's festivities. They too share similar legends. But what is the connection? Everybody say things like to some of our kids look like their family, you know, yes. we go back history mm -hmm. many years ago. Yes. Is there something more behind mere physical resemblance? Apparently there's a triangle. Yeah. It's called the Pacific Triangle. We just know that the, the Pacific Triangle, that's all we've been taught. At the core of their common understanding is a land of shared origins. Hawaii Nui, Hawaii Roa, Hawaii Pama Mao. A big, 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 big Hawaii. Right. <laughs> a very long, long right. Hawaii. Hawaii, the mythical homeland of the Polynesians, a legendary place which was the point of departure to populate the Pacific Islands, including New Zealand. But how does Taiwan fit into this picture? Perhaps my army's friend, Gulas Yotaka, who brought the Ngati Manu tribe here, may help us decipher these intricacies. Actually, we know that we have strong similarities from the dancing and songs. We feel connected to each other strongly. <laughs> Taiwan indigenous peoples have to be very confident. It's not the Pacific Ocean divide us. It's the ocean for us all together. Amis and Iban belong to a group of people known as the Austronesians, whose languages are spread across at least three continents over an area of 26,000 square kilometers, from Madagascar to Easter Island. The earliest versions of their languages are only found amongst Taiwan's indigenous peoples, prompting scholars to believe that their diaspora might have started from this very island. A hypothesis Professor Peter Bellwood named Out of Taiwan. I have a, a very firm and strong belief that the spread of the Austronesian languages occurred in the mouths of people who spoke early versions of those languages. In other words, the Austronesian language family has spread as a result of a human migration. And in the case of the Austronesian languages, the oldest traceable homeland, that one would have to be in Taiwan. Austronesian languages are today spoken by more than 300 million people. 
The Out of Taiwan hypothesis suggests that their language similarities follow a migration pattern starting in Taiwan, which can be traced as far as Eastern Polynesia and Madagascar. Ancient stories and much of the science would seem to suggest that Taiwan was the homeland of several peoples now living separated by thousands of kilometers of open sea. But one point is still unclear. How could a people with only a Stone Age technology created vessels capable of traveling through the rough ocean? Some believe that Taiwan may have been the point of origin for one of the world's largest migration of ancient times, that of the Austronesian people, who spread their languages over three continents starting 5,000 years ago. But to do so, the ancients needed the right vessels. We're heading to the Sidal Hunter School in Hualian, eastern Taiwan, where a group of 19th century refugees, known as the Sakizaya, have preserved ancient army skills. This tribe tried to stay away from the Qing dynasty because the Qing soldier wanted to kill them all. Hide here and the armies try to accept them. But then what happened to the Sakibaya? Did they continue in their own traditions or did they adopt those of the armies? You know what? It's quite difficult. They hide their uh, name, they hide their language, yeah. they hide their all the traditional things. One army's boat building technique in particular was kept alive by the Sakizaya, the bamboo raft. We're asking Elder Wu Junan how it's built, to understand if it could survive the rough seas. Well, well, in every archival image or illustration I've seen of one of these traditional Taiwanese rafts, they've always have this very distinctive upturned bow. First, the branches are curved by heating them up. <laughs> Once the bamboo poles are ready, they have to be tied together. Now we're going to be using the rattan, yes. tied it up from this side to the, to the, the end. Rattan is a common binding material among the armies. It's, it's amazing how flexible it is. I know. It's soft, but really, really strong yeah. Yeah, at the yeah. same time. This is a pre-metallic uh, Stone Age economy, so everything has to be manufactured from organic sources. But it's durable, it's, it's flexible. You can do almost anything with it. This is an indigenous knowledge, some things we can learn. Well, Julian, it looks like you know how to do it. <laughs> But is this enough to transport people almost 10,000 kilometers of ocean from here? To test the theory, we're trying out this replica of one of their ancient rafts. And like before any sea voyages, there are traditions we have to respect. That's an offering, betel yeah. nut, yeah. sticky rice. Yes. And these are offerings to the... For the, the god of the sea. Hey! Namo kami! Isangay mitu! Himawe tutuon! Well, we've seen how the raft is constructed and put together, and now it's up to us to see if the thing floats. But maybe there is something more we need to know about them. 
Well, I don't know about your ancestors, Yoshifu, but my feet are wet. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> I think this kind of condition just only suitable for fishing nearby. I don't think it's strong enough to, to go too far, far away or, or long distance. Yeah, it's just a sort of coastal marine yeah. foraging and fishing, as you say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we have to consider the fact that somehow your ancestors, they got from the island Taiwan to at least the nearest islands, and they must have got there somehow. If this raft was only suitable for coastal exploration, are there any stronger vessels that could have transported the first Austronesian explorers out into the Pacific? And if Professor Bellwood's theory is correct, how did they venture even further towards the east? Could an ancient people have traveled nearly 10,000 kilometers over rough seas from one island to another to spread their culture across at least three continents? Some believe that during the greatest diaspora of ancient times, the Austronesians did just that. To find out what type of boats might have enabled this journey, we're following a lead at the southernmost inhabited island of Taiwan, Orchid Island home to the Yami, or as they call themselves, Tao, whose distinctive boat, the Tatala, also has a bigger version built for oceanic travels. Here we are. This is the Jin Gran, the Jin Gran. It's not a small boat, because it's 二十二十七个板子组成的，这个金石哥让哈，在我们来来讲是办的比较重要，要维持住家里的一些一些吃的啊，那些的，还有一些拜拜。阿雄 is a local fisherman in the Tao village of Iratai, and like all Austronesian peoples, they keep the memories of their ancestors not in records, but in stories passed down from one generation to the next. Paternes, the closest Philippine archipelago, is less than 200 kilometers from here. To understand if the Chinakalan is seaworthy enough to face this journey, we decide to join the Iratai villagers for a fishing expedition. Actually, it's not quite as painful as I thought, but it does require a certain amount of concentration to make sure my oar goes in the water at the same time as everybody else. You can feel the boat really charging through the waves. I feel amazing because it's so easy to control, and then the speed wire is quite quick. I feel fantastic. Okay, we, we've hoped to over a fishing, potential fishing site. We've got six men in the water. They're diving down deep, free diving, and they're laying out a net about 300 meters from one end to the other, I believe. And then we're going to beat the water, and it's going to drive the fish towards the net. And then when we're happy with that, we're going to bring the ends together, and all the fish will be drawn towards the boat. We're going to close to fishermen because they got a fish already. They're going to bring the fish onto the boat. <laughs> more fish coming. <laughs> we got more fish. Have a look, this one, Julian. Yeah, yeah, I've never seen it's that. Beautiful, beautiful, this.
So, Yoshifu, what do you think of that? When I uh, roll, that boat over there, I think it's uh, easier, and then also the speed is quite fast. They tell me, say, their ancestors do explore uh, to the other islands. With a hull designed to cut through ocean waves, this local boat seems stable enough to get to the Philippines. But could it travel even further? To see if there's any record of the voyages in local culture, we're asking Tao expert Shaman Machinana. But there's something that doesn't fit the picture. And how did it get to be that way? The Tao language belongs to a different Austronesian family, much closer to the one found in the Philippines. What can this tell us about the Austronesian migration and how they reached New Zealand? To find out, we have decided to split our journeys. Yoshifu will follow the loose strand of his people's cultural weave in search of clues, while I follow the trail to the Pacific Ocean in search of fragments that could better satisfy my curiosity. We're looking for clues into one of humanity's greatest migrations, that of the Austronesian people who covered thousands of kilometers of open ocean millennia ago without much of the technology we have today. With no written tradition, the memory of these voyages was lost and only remained alive in legends, such as that of the Maori's mythical homeland, also known as Hawaii. Now, one of the first and most influential writers on the myth of Hawaii was the ethnographer Percy Smith. And this is what he had to say. There were different names for this mythical land. For the Maoris, it was Hawaii. On Hawaii, it was known as Kahiki. And on Easter Island, it was Hiva. Of these names, Hawaii, the Maori form of the word, is the principal. Now, Smith thought that the original homeland of the Austronesians was India. Modern science has proved him wrong. But that's not to say that his understanding of Polynesian mythology can provide us with important clues for where the original homeland of the Austronesian did in fact lie. Several clues suggest they may have departed from Taiwan, but the people living on Taiwan's southernmost inhabited island, Orchid Island, seem to have stronger language connections with the Philippines. To understand how the journey took place, I'm traveling 183 kilometers out of Taiwan to the archipelago of Batanes in the Philippines to meet local boat builder Florentino Galana. What kind of boat are you working on here? A Tataya. This name is strikingly similar to the Orchid Island boats. Did you make bigger boats which could go greater distances? That is the same word that they use for the big boats in Orchid Island. This is Tataya. There they have Tatala for the same kind of boat. What does that suggest to you about the connection between the people of Batanes and the people of Orchid Island? 
ibatan pero men tak tai de dike ya pi tu anak pi tan kana ana dawa aku masa som na mapan hukum de jer jeram batak na ta dajam tatala pero jayam tataya Orchid Island shares closer language ties with the Philippines than Taiwan. I want to look at the links between these two people, hoping to find proofs of how the migration may have happened. Okay, salamat. The idea of an ancestral island homeland, Hawaii, is widespread across the Austronesian world. But this is not just a home for the ancestors. It's also the land of the dead, an earthly paradise very like this world, except perfect. And it's where the dead return to, to be reunited with those who have gone before them. Local historian Ed Delphin is showing me how. This is an ancient burial site of our ancestors in the islands and speaks of our connection with the homeland we have here their journey to afterlife is through a boat. Across the across sea. The sea. Yeah. Exactly. When they die, they use this to sail to afterlife. And because the final resting place is the sea. So this is obviously a, a reproduction of one of the canoes of Tatayas. Well, exactly. It's a kind of semblance of the, what we have, yeah. uh, what we are using in, in the present day Tatayas here. Yeah. Right, but I mean, we, we can see the, the ocean out there. And it strikes me that to the north is Taiwan, and is there some sort of connection? From the stories of the past, we know that our ancestors sailed from the north to our islands here. And this is probably around 4,500 before the present. And, and from that, those years, they, they occupied the area. And then after a certain period of time, some of our ancestors sailed back to the northern part and settled in Orchid Island. We share the same culture. The local vessels allowed the migration to happen not just in one direction. There was a time in the past when people living in this area connected through the ocean. They were traveling back and forth, living from the sea together as one. But those links have been forgotten. At present, we have suffered the effect of the enculturation brought about the dominant culture of the majority. The, the sad thing here is that what we believe in or what belongs to the past is bad. But all of these things you see in Batanes will tell you that we form part of the Austronesian community sharing bands of culture, the language, and the identity. How can their identity be protected and ensure that the stories of the great voyagers are not lost? And what can they tell us about our present world? While my friend Yoshifu finds out what place indigenous wisdom can still have in the modern era, I'm reaching out to science to determine whether these links are more than just myths. I was born into the Amish tribe, amidst the mountains of East Taiwan. Ever since I was young, all I knew were the lands around me. But my elders would always whisper old stories of how our ancient brothers left their families to undertake a journey beyond the sea's horizons in search of new lands. But could they really have braved over almost 10,000 kilometers of rough ocean to come here? And can I find traces of my heritage in what's left of these distant communities? I am the land of the Long Hwai Cloud, or Aotearoa, as local people would call it, to look for hints of how our languages are connected. And you will be forgiving for not knowing where I am, as this is a Maori name for New Zealand. Maori language, or Te Reo Maori, is spoken by a shrinking number of New Zealanders today. But some are trying to change this trend. Like David, a teacher in a local school who is helping to revive use of Maori language. Welcome, welcome. Wow. 
I like the way uh, you we, we, we doing this. What does that mean for oh, nose to nose? Yes. Touching nose. Oh, touching nose. It's me sharing my breath of life with you. So the native school. Mm. That was all about assimilating mm. my people into the majority culture. Mm, mm. So trying to make us mm. uh, Pake, which is non non Maori. Mm. Um, so so that was the start of it. And uh, don't speak Maori. Speak English only. If you're caught speaking Māori, mm. you are going to be disciplined. And with the loss of their language, some of the older legends also disappeared. Hawaii. Mm. Yeah, I've heard that. I, I heard that so many times when I was growing up. Mm. But if you were to ask me mm. to point on the map where Hawaii is, yes. I couldn't tell you. Okay. But for me, Hawaii, because my tūpuna, my ancestors, mm. told me mm -hmm. that such a place existed, it, then it exists. To be able to uncover if our heritage is embedded within Maori language, I have decided to take part in one of Davis Beginners' class. Hi, kia ora Welcome to you all. We're going to focus on two areas today. One is the uh, what we call ngā wāhanga o te tinana, which is the, the parts of the body, and also the numbers, or counting, at least up to ten. So, e hia ngā pene, how many pens are there? E rima nga pen. Oh, ka mautewehi, ka mautewehi. Yeah. Very good, very good. Very good, excellent. Well done. Well done. This is very interesting. At least two or three, I think it's quite similar or almost same. Uh, like number three, turu. We say turu. Here, turu. Number five, rima. We say rima as well. Gosh, I'm it's going insane. to shout for this. I'm shaking. <laughs> and also the other body parts, very interesting. The leg, awai. Why, 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 why? Mm -hmm. We call awai. Okay. Yeah. The ear, we call tangira. Quite similar, not exactly the same, but close. Well, there you go. <laughs> very short and sharp. <laughs> But as much as David's work has made me realize how close we are, it's also made me wonder how fragile these links could become if they are not nurtured in the present time. So next, I'm visiting a friend who is working to keep our language links up with the times. Katalamapo is a young Maori singer who is trying to reinvent the tradition by bringing Maori language into popular songs. Singing in Te Reo Maori mm -hmm. is one of my big dreams to get my language out to the world, so yeah. Music is a part of our life. Yeah. That, that's why uh, when I hear from you, and it's, I just feel it's so touching. It's, you, you got a gift. Having grown up speaking exclusively Maori, Katalama is part of a younger generation of indigenous people allowed to learn their language in school. I grew up talking Te Reo Maori, mm. being taught Te Reo Maori, mm. and um, I must say it's an amazing thing. Because mm, mm, mm. a few years, oh, back when my grandparents, they weren't allowed to talk Maori. That gives her an insight on how to continue her people's legacy. Through singing, we, we get to share our stories, our Māori stories, to our younger generation and our older generation. Because our older generation, some of them don't even know how to talk Māori, so we're still trying to, I don't know, to improve, maybe. Also, uh, continue the uh, culture. Yeah. Naru wan, naru wan, do iyo in, iyo in hoya. O kare kare ana, na uai oro toru wa, fiti atu kuehine. Like many of the indigenous languages in Taiwan. Māori was almost lost through history. With no written tradition, our culture was inscribed in chants that were passed down from one generation to the other. Just as today back then, music and songs are an important way 
to keep this culture alive. And I'm right in time to see how. Wow, what is this? Uh, this is our panifa. I'm joining Katarama for the New Year festivities, or Matariki. That's like for the armies, is based on a lunar calendar. Today, she will be performing in the Marae, the Maori ancestral meeting house. Marae is one of many places where we come together. These are our eyes. This is the nose. This is the whole face. The tongue, the mouth. Tanifa, they belong in the ocean. And ocean to us is Tangaroa. He rules in the ocean, so when he's angry, the waters are gonna be very rough when he's happy. It's calm. And I am teaming up with her to celebrate the end of Matariki. We sing all the time because a part of our cultural. So this is like singing daytime and nighttime. So I hope you like it. After the concert, I'm taking a chance to thank Katalama my own way. <laughs> I went to uh, language school to learn uh, Maori language. I find out maybe 20% quite similar, like number or a part of our body. And I was wondering, maybe our ancestors have a connecting uh, before. In our history, no one's ever said that we've had like connection with Taiwanese people. So only recently people have said yes, the features of your people look so similar to the features of my people. The importance of keeping our culture alive in present times has suggested me that there might be some sort of connection in the last myth of our tribes. But that is not enough to conclude that Taiwan is the legendary homeland of today's Austronesian peoples. We need to rely on more than just rituals and stories. So I am en route to see if I can find a more primal link within ourselves. Although they are living on more than three continents, there are similarities shared by all Austronesian peoples, not just Taiwan's indigenous tribes and the Maori. But I need to learn whether their connection is more than just a coincidence. When the first European explorers and navigators entered the Pacific in the 17th and 18th centuries, it immediately became clear to them that there was a striking resemblance between the peoples of one island and the next, and not just in terms of language, but also customs and beliefs. So much so that by the end of the 19th century, the New Zealand ethnologist Percy Smith could actually believe that Hawaii was a real place. At that time, no scientific instruments were adequate enough to find a reliable solution to this riddle. But today, scientific evidence can give us a better insight as to what might actually have happened. So I've come to the National Museum of Natural Science in Taichung to unravel this mystery. Professor, when I was doing my research, we were relying largely on linguistic models and on archaeological models. But since then, genetics has entered the picture in a big way. What does DNA have to add to our story? DNA tells us that the Maori people have a mixed genome. It is 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 a mixed genome. 巴布亚人的这个男性所取代掉了
，那毛利人身上的立腺体 DNA 都只有从波利尼西亚人的这样的一个特征，而这可以追溯到台湾的立腺体 DNA， 所以我们就发现到毛利人身上的基因组成有台湾的母系组成，也有巴布亚人身上的父系组成。But present-day Mari DNA only tells us one part of the story, since DNA samples have only been compared to those of modern Taiwanese indigenous peoples. This is we recently discovered a human DNA sample. That it is approximately 2,000 years old. Wow. So these remains came from a burial site. They. 我们还会看到很多的陪葬的物品，包括说像陶器啦、琉璃珠啦，全面拼凑他们当时生活的样貌。We can be confident that this is an Austronesian burial. 台湾的汉人来到台湾，大概就是从十六世纪，距今大概五百年，所以我们相信这一群生活在台湾岛上的人，都是台湾原住民的祖先，也就是南岛民族。Chen hopes to be able to extract DNA from these remains and determine whether genetics can link not just the present but also the past. We have tried to DNA out the DNA, but because Taiwan's soil is a bit sour, the DNA environment is a bit bad, so the DNA extracted from the human DNA is very small. 现在台湾的遗传的资讯大部分都是现身人的 DNA 为主。Science has shown that the DNA of the Taiwanese tribes can be found coded within the genes of Austronesian communities as far as New Zealand. And something even more important was brought along with that. When the Austronesians reached the islands of Melanesia, the female line remained the same, and we can trace that all the way back to Taiwan. But perhaps the genes is not what is important here, but the Austronesian language and the cultural ideas that go with it. They continued into the Pacific. Only part of the genetic heritage remains visible today. But in our tribe, dispersed across the ocean, different symbolisms still remain in our customs. Further suggesting that the voyages of the Austronesian diaspora came from one point of origin, the land of the ancestors. But now the fundamental question remains. Austronesians did not just migrate, they traveled back and forth, transporting their culture almost 10,000 kilometers from home. Just what was it that gave the ancients the confidence to cross this vast expanse of ocean? How did their culture adapt to the local environment, resulting in changes in their DNA? Next, I will follow the trail of the Austronesian migration down to Fiji in the Melanesian Islands to discover if more signs could suggest how Austronesian culture possibly expanded. Just why I'm looking to find back how our knowledge and strength can be united again. To wipe off the dust and find out how the past can be beneficial to our world today. <laughs>